Hello, everyone. Um, I am Greg Strange, coming to you live from my kitchen. And uh, I am, for today's purposes, the chair of the Easton Planning and Zoning Board. And I'm joined by Stephanie Danielson, who is our longtime director of planning, among other roles in, in town. And we just wanted to take a few quick minutes today, um, since we are proposing five zoning articles at special town meeting on November 30th. We thought in keeping with past tradition, we would uh, give you a quick uh, rundown and synopsis and explanation of, of what we've been working on at the planning board and uh, what these zoning articles uh, include. So, um, and just for anybody that was curious, the, the background here, since my house is rather busy today, I thought I would share, this is a picture um, compliments of the Eastern Historical Society of Five Corners District or of Five Corners in 1890. And you can see a, uh, a trolley, which actually used to service Stoughton, Easton, and Canton, which uh, when actually was abandoned in 18, I'm sorry, 1909 due to lack of ridership. So hopefully with improvements that we're proposing for the district, we can we can bring back the trolley. <laughs> a little, little levity there. But anyway, so um, Thanks for joining us, like I said, and, you know, quickly the, the roles, I just, you know, the planning board, planning and zoning board, we, um, along with approving certain types of projects called out in our town zoning bylaws, we maintain the zoning bylaws, we maintain and create uh, master plans and, you know, basically land use. Uh, I think it's really important, uh, as do my other board members, to uh, that local residents have a say in their land use and, and rules that govern that. Uh, in the growth of the town and uh, preserving of open space and, and of changing of bylaws. And uh, Stephanie, as the director of planning, you know, works with us, she works with many boards. She, I don't I think people don't, don't realize how many, how many hours uh, Stephanie puts in, but she uh, not only participates in obviously all the meetings we have, she uh, coordinates our work with you know, town council and other state boards and helps us uh, with adherence to local zoning. She deals with landowners and developers and people who just have general questions or issues with zoning in town. And so we have been lucky to work with Stephanie really on and off for many, on many different roles in town for about, I don't know, 12 or 13 years now. So 14, 14 not yes. to be too 14, exact. Right, well, yeah, 50, yeah, exactly. So um, anyway, so, um, and the process that we take when we do all this, you know, we, we have all, all of our meetings are public, you know, they're always, they're posted on the town's website, they're always on ECAT. Um, in the past, they were open to the public. Um, hopefully, we'll, we'll get back to that someday when, when COVID uh, passes. Um, but our, our meetings are still uh, available uh, through Zoom and uh, you can, in, in uh, public presentation, uh, public participation, um, carries on and is vibrant. It's just in a slightly different form. Um, so leading up to some of these articles that we're proposing at town meeting this year are, are really based on a few things. Going back to the master plan, the Envision Easton master plan that was written uh, by and for the residents of Easton, as well as many of the staff uh, members in Easton um, about five, five years ago, Stephanie. Right. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, you, what, what's a master plan? You know, we, over a period of 14 or 15 months held dozens and dozens of meetings and info sessions and reach out and, and surveys and to, to, to answer a myriad of questions, everything for, you know, from land use and affordable housing and historical preservation, open space preservation, where, would, where we would like to see areas grow, where we would like, not like to see grow. Um, you know, what would people in town like to see happen you know, in Easton? Um, and of course, everybody would always prefer that that piece of land right next to them just stay undeveloped and fully treed. But, you know, just like the property that they live or work on, landowners do have rights, you know, with their land. So we, we try to craft uh, working documents to, um, to allow people to, to use their land, develop the land, improve their land. But, you know, along the lines of, of what the town would like to see through all those myriad uh, examples that I brought up or I, you know, so anyways, enough babbling. So we have um, five articles we are presenting this year, article uh, 15 to 19. Article 15 is 
Yeah, I guess I don't need to give the list. We can just start with it. So um, uh, Article 15, um, basically, you know, right now our bylaw allows hand laundering in Quisit commercial districts B and C, uh, which is basically is 138 up near uh, from say Stoneforge down to uh, Dean Fuel. That, that's the Quisit commercial district for the most part. And it's allowed, uh, hand laundering is allowed in the village business district, which is downtown Northeastern and industrial districts. Uh, we are, the genesis of this was to allow a, a laundromat in Quisit district A, which would help service the, that neighborhood in, in Stonehill and would be, I think a, a, good, uh, a good addition for the town from an economic uh, standpoint and, and from a sewer standpoint with the new sewer district down there, it'd be nice to uh, you know, increase fees that the town can take in. So uh, during the writing of this bylaw, we discovered the, the, the definition of bylaw of a laundromat was hand laundry, which was, I think we could say was a bit ambiguous, Stephanie. So yes, um, yeah. you know, so, so this basically just, what this does, this change hands laundry to laundromat and adds it into Cuisid Commercial District. So pretty, pretty cut and dry. I don't know, Stephanie, do you have any, anything you want to add to that? Or? No, um, the only thing I would add is that, you know, looking at other communities, they definitely had laundromats as a use. Some of them had laundromats and hand laundry, laundering. So again, it just added confusion as to what was really meant by a hand laundry. So this clarifies that as, as well as allowing it in the commercial district A. Great. So yeah, I still don't know what hand laundry is. <laughs> I think so, once but, upon a time, people had their laundry hand right. washed. That's by true, I guess. Others. I just yeah. would have thought that predated zoning, right? You know, but, <laughs> yeah. um, so that's article, whoops, that's article 15. Um, next we have article 16. And this is to allow by special permit, which would be granted by the Planning and Zoning Board, uh, mixed use in the village business district. So first off, the, the uh, boundary of the village business district, which you can see in the map that Stephanie has up, it's, it's basically downtown Northeastern. Uh, if you see that sort of triangle of roads, that that is the rockery right, where the yeah. where the hand icon is, and then that that's Main Street traveling left to right, and the, basically the district on the the left end, which would be the the western end on this side, uh, includes the uh, 66, 68 Main Street, which is the old bank building across from Oaks Ames Hall, and the two buildings to the left of that. It skips over. Uh, the gas station, and then picks up everything on the northern end of Main Street down to uh, Shangri-La. Shangri-La, thank you. The the um, the salon on the corner of Main and Mechanic, and then across the street starts at the building. And you think everybody knows the sort of building that has seen better days, but it, on the corner of uh, Main and Williams, includes the duplex house to the left of that, and then travels back to the left on this map or to, to the west, um, all the way to the um, Lincoln Street School, um, the, uh, the apartments uh, that uh, Mr. King owns. And also picks up the first two buildings on each side on Center Street. So you can think of uh, paint, paint, dust, paint Rust and Pixie Dust building and the studio to the left of that and then across the street, Oxford Cleaners, and the lot, uh, which is now uh, vacant, where the house was demolished uh, maybe two or three years ago. So um, as some of you may know, we, we actually have a lot of mixed use in this district. Mixed use is defined by a, a mix of commercial, normally, uh, typically on the first floor, and that, that's true in this district, um, and then residential units above. Right now, all the residential units in this district are apartments, uh, but it doesn't mean, you know, you could certainly be an ownership situation too if someone were to propose that. But currently there are, looking at my notes, there are eight buildings, at least eight buildings in the district that meet mixed use. So we wanted to, 
um, see if we could come up with a way. One of the, the most important things I thought coming out of the master plan were looking to create diverse housing types in East. And so we didn't, you know, that didn't just mean apartments in a large scale apartment building or, you know, uh, or a standalone luxurious um, single family house, you know, priced in the close to the north or south of a million dollars um, for, for young families and for baby, uh, for, for, um, you know, for, you know, for empty nesters. Um, we were looking to create, and, and just anybody, we were looking to create different housing types, smaller houses um, and, and walkable neighborhoods. You know, this village business district, as we've seen since Shovel Works was renovated five or five years ago, um, uh, we've really had a, a renaissance downtown and would like that to continue. And part of that is creating some residences, not many, but just some to, to allow uh, more people to enjoy residing in the area. With the, as we know, it's a great resource, um, resource rich architectural gems around there, a lot of open space, many parks, the libraries uh, and the downtown area. So we looked at many different ways to many ratios uh, to allow um, through special permit. And I should just back up. A special permit means it's not by right. Um, the applicant would come to the planning board and would work with us um, in creating what they would like to do. This is much of this district is part of, is in the Ames local historic district. So there are buildings which need to be preserved and a whole set of rules that govern those. And uh, we would, you know, this is, um, a very important area for the town. So we will, we want to make sure that anything that is proposed meets the character of the town and the scale of the neighborhood um, and is beneficial to the town. So going through the special permit process allows us to do that and allows the residents to participate in the process. Um, we don't have a lot of old neighborhoods like this and, and we want to protect it. So that's the reasoning behind that. And the ratio we ended up with was one unit allowed for every 2,500 square feet what square feet of land area. <clears throat> now, if you think of it, an, an acre is 43,560 square feet. And if you broke that out, you're, you know, you're looking at, well, wait a minute, we're allowing, you know, many units per acre, but the lots down in this area, the, the, the average lot size is about 4,200 square feet. Uh, they range, the smallest lot is 1,900 square feet. And, and the largest lot is the Northeastern Grammar Building. Uh, which is 132,000 square feet. Um, but you could see it, there was a table that we presented um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's available online that it just showed the ratios. And you know, you're looking, most of the buildings would be allowed to have anywhere from say two to five units. Uh, there are a couple areas that are larger um, and be based on land area could, could have, have more. But again, it would be, it would have to be something that is designed uh, in keeping with the neighborhood, uh, adhering to the local historic districts. So, um, and, and it's not like every building is going to do this, but we wanted to, um, you know, in planning, you have, you have to create a, you have to look ahead and create a, uh, a set of um, rules by which people can, can try to meet the needs and the, and the, and the wishes of the town. So um, anyway, so that's, that is, I wouldn't say a brief summary. I babbled on a little bit, forgive me. But Stephanie, is there anything I missed or you'd like to add on that? Um, I, I'd just like to point out the pictures that we've included here show uh, Bill's Pizza, which I think it has six units currently. Yep. And under um, the, the proposal, um, again, this is an existing use, so nothing will change for this building as long as it continues in its current use. But if they were to add apartments today, it would um, it would have one unit less under this ratio. And the same with the farmer's daughter, which has four units, but under this uh, proposed ratio, they would have one. Again, nothing changes for those two buildings and their uses because they're existing, but just to give a people an idea of what the density might look like. Yeah, that, that's a good point. You know, I guess you know, I, we're, we're trying to match sort of the density that's there. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that, that's a very good, very good point. Um, okay, so next, um, and really the biggest, the whole reason that I put the old five corners picture in my background, 
that the biggest project the planning board has been working on in the last 18 to 24 months is the Furnace Village District. Uh, you think originally we started it as the Five Corners District, but we we changed the name along the way. Actually, at the at the um, recommendation of a resident that was participating in one of our many public meetings, and the district um, runs. Well, the, for the reason for this, I, let me jump back. The purpose for this is to uh, take advantage of the sewer that went in, uh, in no specific order, and to create a, a walkable neighborhood. Um, and uh, to promote, you know, promote an environment uh, that is, can be a little more pedestrian oriented. You know, we're thinking hopefully within the next 10 years, we will see this stretch of 106 and 123 um, redesigned with, and built by, to allow uh, sidewalks and, you know, a little more green space uh, and an amenity such as, you know, benches and, and to really help out, as we know, there's a, there's a, an existing stretch of businesses there that um, we would like to help stimulate by creating options uh, with their land, such, such as mixed use, uh, such as different, um, different uh, densities based on uh, some of the items called out in the bylaw. And, you know, it's a unique stretch of land. Do you want to, want to put the map up? Yep. Stephanie? Um, what's it's actually it's not a very large district so as you can see on the map here again uh, left, north is looking up so to the left that red area uh, that is the intersection oh, sorry of, I zoomed uh, way too far that is the intersection of Highlands Plaza or do you think we're you know where target and big big Y are um, and that is we are calling that the Eastman Street subdistrict uh, on the opposite end in that pink color, that is the Depot Street. That's actually Five Corners, what we all kind of call Five Corners. Where Stephanie's computer hand was, that's Shaw's Plaza. Um, and this is the uh, Depot Street subdistrict. The yellow areas in the middle are the residential transition district. Or those are the you know, most of the residences that we, we think of when we go through there. And then um, just on the north in the middle, a small little blue area, uh, that, that is at the intersection of Pequantico Ave and Turnpike Street. I'm sorry, Foundry Street. And uh, that is, if you think of the old Keach Law Offices, the brick building, there's a series of uh, four properties there, I believe, that in, and the, there's a car dealership. that are existing businesses, uh, business district, and we're keeping them that way. Um, so we looked at this as a really unique opportunity because uh, on both ends, on one end you have, there's a large plaza and quite a bit of, not, not vacant land, but you know, large industrial areas up towards Mansfield. And then as you're traveling um, towards Five Corners, you know, you go through the beautiful historic area with the, the, the a few, some fantastic uh, old structures have survived and the ponds and some, some of the green space, the emerald necklace from the open space of Easton intersects here. And then it picks up again as you get further down towards um, the subway, the, the plaza with the subway restaurant and um, the other restaurants there and McGuire's uh, and, uh, you know, a whole slew of businesses. So we wanted to come up with a way to stimulate the economic growth of this area to help with the, the sewer district, uh, the diff that was passed uh, for the residents in this area last year and to take advantage of the sewer. Um, and at the same time, we wanted to keep the residential area in the, in the middle. You know, the, the residents that lived there, were, it was very important to them to, to maintain the character of the neighborhood and to, to maintain it as a residential area. So if you were to read through the bylaw, um, I, I think we've done um, a, a very good job through an awful lot of work. Um, with you know, and I with we worked with some professional planners on this. We worked with you know Stephanie and her staff, um, and we worked quite a bit with with the residents. We held uh, many many public hearings. We did neighborhood meetings. We had one on one sessions, um, and th those continued to this day. And this that this was really a great example of what um, we try to do with the planning board you know, as I said earlier, I think it's really important that residents have a say in their land use. And 
That's why I've been on this board for 15 years. I think it's, um, it's really important that the residents keep their, their toe in the water on this because it's the residents that live in this town. And, um, and so, but it, there's nothing wrong with taking help from professionals and from listening, uh, you know, and, and, and bouncing ideas off of folks and, and looking at what we've done in the past and looking what other, at what other towns do. So in a nutshell, um, what we're hoping to, to, what we're hoping we've done is put tools in place here that will allow property owners to expand their uses, um, add new uses such as, as mixed use, um, different types of residences, um, and different types of businesses. And, you know, I've seen some talk online about this, you know, people might, might catch one little thing. And, you know, for example, in the residential subdistrict, we're allowing house lot sizes to be 15,000 square feet down from the, the 40,000 square feet. But it's important to remember that many, many of these lots are already um, in that area or even less than that. And if you were to look at this, you know, there's you possibly, you know, if, it, and I don't think this would happen. I don't think every owner is going to go out and suddenly subdivide their land. But, but even if that were the case, they could you know, possibly add maybe five or six residents to this area. So, so not a huge number, but again, through the special permit process, that would allow us to ensure that the houses that go up would be in, sort of in a historical scale. You know, a smaller lot should have a slightly s smaller house, not, not, not necessarily in total area, but in how it's, how it's shaped, you know. Um, you know. If you look back, some of the, a lot of the old neighborhoods downtown that have three or two, three, four, or five thousand square foot lots, you know, they don't have houses that are full, you know, ten foot ceilings and and you know steep roof pitches. They a lot of old balloon frame houses where the roofs. If you ever look at some of the houses downtown, the roofs start sort of at the midpoint of the windows. So there's lots of ways to kind of keep the scale of the house down. So I think we could. You know, would be looking at creative, creating creative neighborhoods here that tie into the history. There's also a provision in this that allows people, if they keep their historic homes, you know, they could add um, some units uh, by working with the historical commission. So, you know, what we see is when we drive through here in 10 years, hopefully we see tree-lined streets, which we, we see, tree, you know, we see sidewalks. We see people going north and south to the, or east and west, technically, to, to the many businesses. Um, and there are folks who don't need to get into their car. They can walk around this neighborhood. More and more people working from home. That's going to continue post COVID. Uh, that's one thing we've certainly learned through this. And, um, you know, we'd be looking there. There's um, if you look into the bylaw, there's um, provisions for mixed use. There's caps on what can be done. There's, you know, you start with um, eight and 10 units per acre, you can do more if there's an affordable housing component, but again, it's all through special permit. So it, it really allows the town to take a look at this on a case by case basis and make sure the project is, you know, meets the, the neighborhood scale that we're looking for in open space and that we don't just create a bunch of, you know, parking lots where we're look, really looking to create a nice walkable neighborhood through here. The traffic, we already get 23,000 cars a day here. Many of those are, you know, coming from 495 to 24. It's not based on anything that's going on in Easton, uh, but we might as well take advantage of those cars going through and use traffic calming and create, you know, create a vibrant uh, downtown area. This is a unique experience given the mix of, or a unique opportunity given the mix of commercial and residential. And that's really what we're, 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 we're trying to do here. Um, this is nothing that's being slammed down anybody's throat. We're not going to someone called me the other day, you know, you know, you're going to put hundreds of units in here. It's not possible. If you, this is a very small area. If you, if you add up the ratios and you add up the lot sizes, you know, we're looking to be able to add some residential units here, but it's, you know, depending on the scenario, it's, it's not, it's not many, but I think it's enough to, to help make this neighborhood what we'd like to see it be. Um, Greg, and if I could just, I'd like to just um, reiterate some of the points that you made sure. that um, targeting this area for economic development and growth has been a long range plan for the town, um, not, not just in the current 
version of the master plan, but also in the previous edition. Um, you know, the town's been planning and working for a long time to sewer this area so that businesses could grow and be supported. When we did the charrette back in the, let's see, was that 2019, the fall of 2019, 2018, with residents and business owners in the district, they reinforced what Greg talked about, that they really wanted to see this as a walkable neighborhood and connected to the businesses you have, as, as Greg pointed out, the, the two business districts that bookend um, the residential district. And the zoning is really going to help promote, um, you know, residents supporting the businesses, but also the businesses supporting the residents um, living there. Greg also mentioned the public participation in the zoning process. And I'd just like to reiterate that, that there was a large group of business owners and property owners, residents from the district who not only participated in the charrette to help define um, or, or refine the vision of this district, but who also participated in the meetings and provided feedback on the zoning as the planning board was developing uh, these proposed amendments. And I, and I wanted to add one thing, Steffi, could you put your, um, your icon, what do we call that? It's not an icon, it's a... My hand? Your hand, yeah, put your hand, just on, on Rick Lincoln's project, on the foundry. Um, one of the things, right, you know, if you're all familiar with the, the foundry or the former foundry. Yeah, it's right here, sorry. Uh, which is at the end of Pequonicut. And it's, it's where recently during the sewer project, the contractors stored uh, you know, much of their um, overflow soil and, um, and equipment. Uh, and so a developer, Rick Lincoln, we've been working with him for, I'd say over three years now. Uh, and he's going through uh, proposing a project which will have 46 um, single family homes, uh, which will be capped at 1,700 square feet, I think I'm getting that. Yes. Yeah. Roughly 1,700 square feet, uh, two bedrooms. They will be a mix of about five or six um, really nice New England style um, homes, you know, richly detailed design in scale. And you can see if you go, you can go on the town's website, the planning board's website and see the, uh, the proposal. And part of this, there's going to be a community center. There's going to be public access. Um, I talked about the, the green necklace, you know, you, you may have heard of the over 4,000 acres of open space that the town has acquired over the last decades. And a big part of that, or a large crossing of that, including the Bay Circuit Trail, is right uh, abuts this whole neighborhood. So part of Mr. Lincoln's project is to propose an area for public parking for about five or six cars and access to this open space where maybe some old trails could be renovated, new trails could be created. Um, and to just help tie this all together. One of the things we've been trying to do since the master plan is we, you know, residents were lucky. We have all these, you know, we have this 4,000 plus acres, but many people don't even, aren't even aware of it or don't know where they are. I know the historical, I mean, the conservation commission has done a great job on their website uh, showing, showing where the land is and, and mapping all the trails. And I think, you know, you, you see these and part of Mr. Lincoln's proposal, he's also, for mitigation to the town, he's creating, he's gonna be installing a traffic light and turning lanes at the intersection of Pequantiquet and Foundry, which as a resident on Pequantiquet, I can tell you is certainly needed from, not only from a safety issue, but it, it will really help out the residents in this area. Um, and, and he's also been giving substantial money towards the redesign of this stretch of road that I had touched on earlier. So that's one of the first um, you know, pins to drop, if you will. One of the, you know, planning uh, takes a long time. We're, we're at the beginning. Stephanie and I and those that work in our teams work, you know, we're planners. We don't, you know, what we do doesn't happen overnight, but we try to work with creating a vision based on all the feedback we have and, and our own ideas of where we think the town would, is, should go, is going, would like to go. And, um, I think you know Rick's investment on that site, Rick Lincoln's investment, is a first step to really help stimulate uh, this area. And now that the sewer is there, um, 
you know, many of the residents realized the, the increase in their property value and the, you know, uh, the, the lots of types of businesses and lots of restaurants haven't been able to come to Easton through the years because of our high water table and our soils, but the sewer really, really changes that. So this area is going to go through a substantial renaissance. And what we're, I guess what to, to sum everything up, we're, what we're trying to do is create a path, create guardrails by which we can keep Easton special. You know, we've been so lucky with all the gifts we got over a century ago that really make our town so different and special. And, we're trying to to keep it that way. We're a firm believer that the more thought that goes into the aesthetic and the layout and the design of a project, not just the building, but the whole site, you know, and, and the amenities, uh, the better it is for the overall success of that because of property values go up and, um, you know, business owners' rents can go up and, and uses can go up. And that, that's really what we're trying to do. Um, so hopefully we'll have your support on this and um, feel free at any point, you know, to reach out to, to Stephanie or myself, you know, you can, you can reach uh, all the information on the town's planning website and would be more than willing to, uh, to discuss with you. Um, so I guess I thought this would be a 10 minute tape. Huh? <laughs> I think, well, Greg, I think there's a lot of good things to say about this zoning yeah, proposal. So um, I, I think giving it um, enough attention is... Yeah, is this is an important, so right. It is. Um, and, and just before we go to the next slide, I mean, there, Greg mentioned the boundary site project, the sawmill project here, but there are other sites that have been purchased in the last few years and um, local developers who are um, looking forward to this zoning passing so that they too can move forward with development that will add to that mixed use and in, in neighborhood character that everyone is looking forward to. Yeah, absolutely. Exciting things coming up in this district. Yeah. And so then 18 and 19, articles 18 and 19 are um, sort of for the, the zoning nerds out there. Do you want me to explain this one, yeah, Greg? I'll let Stephanie do these. Okay, so yeah, be, being a kind of a, a, a geek myself. So currently the table of uses, which um, lays out what uses are allowed in which districts um, has what we'd call traditional uh, zoning uses uh, listed out. And the um, way that the uses have been defined for the Furnace Village District the village district and Quisit commercial district have been through the use table. If we add all those in together, it becomes rather unwieldy. So the proposal here is to divide the table into two tables, a one for traditional zoning in um, what people would recognize as your more traditional zoning districts, residential, business, industrial, and municipal. For those who don't know, Ely Mawsonary means charitable, and that is the area covered by Stonehill College. That's just an interesting note. Um, then the second table will be Appendix A2, and that's where all the special zoning districts will be listed. Their uses will be listed and allowed. It will actually make it much easier for people trying to understand what they can and um, cannot do or what types of uses are allowed or not allowed in a particular district to read through and figure out um, what applies to that particular zone. And Greg, do you want me to get yeah. the, the you're, dimensional? You're Sure. Yeah, dimensional and density regulations. This table has long um, indicated what the setback requirements are, what the lot requirements are, frontage for uh, uh, lots within uh, particular districts. Again, we needed to add that information for the um, new Furnace Village subdistricts and also. Um, for the commercial and mixed use buildings in the Furnace Village District. In addition to that, the planning board established different regulations for motels and major projects. 
So those are also listed in this table. So really this is just an addition of new information to support the proposed zoning amendments. Yeah, exactly. Basically 18 and 19 are just sort of a reorganization of paperwork for those of us that work in the zoning bylaw, right? When you think about it, so. Um, and I'm just going to do a pitch um, so that people are well aware the zoning bylaw for anyone who's interested as it currently exists is accessible through the Easton Town Code. You can find it on the navigation bar on the left-hand side of the Town of Easton website homepage. And if you want to review in detail the uh, proposed zoning amendments, you can find those on the Planning and Zoning Board webpage at, from the Easton Town website. Great, so I think we've covered everything. Is there anything you think we've missed? I, I don't think so. Again, um, Greg, Greg said this before, if you have any questions, uh, you want clarification on any of the proposed amendments, feel free to give me a call. Um, my phone number is 508-230-0641 or reach out to Greg. I will not be giving out my cell phone, <laughs> <laughs> but people seem to find me. So it's all, it's all, you can always, you can always get me on Facebook No, but anyways, you certainly can get in touch with me through Stephanie. So um, I want to thank Jason Daniels for, for uh, helping out today and Stephanie, Thank you. Uh, I'll give her a 8.5 on Room Raider. Um, oh, thank you. And uh, is that at her I'm house? I'm assuming that's good. And um, so thank you, everybody. If you've uh, stuck it out and watched this long, we certainly appreciate it. And we hope um, we've answered any questions you have. And I hope we can have your support at Special Town Meeting um, on November 30th. And have a great Thanksgiving. And stay safe, folks. <laughs>